Welcome to the 13th episode of Foreign Correspondence Deeper into Hitchcock podcast. My name is Michał Oleszczyk and I'm joined as always by my co-host Sebastian Smoliński. Hello, Michał. It's great to see you. We are still in full uh, coronavirus lockdown. Although some measures of security are already being eased, so we already decided that our next episode will be recorded live since we are both in Warsaw, Poland. But now the final, hopefully the final episode that we are recording through Skype. I'm in one part of Warsaw and uh, Sebastian is in another. We are only a few subway stops away, but it's the sign of the times that we are recording this in a fashion like this. And uh, today um, we will discuss a film that I find very exciting, a film that was quite divisive in Hitchcock's scholarship. Some people dismissed it, some people praised it probably too much, <laughs> excessively. Uh, a bit too eagerly, yes. Uh, but a certainly an odd beast and an interesting case and a surprising entry in uh, Hitchcock's filmography, which is Rich and Strange, a film that premiered in December 1931, a film based on a novel by Dale Collins, an Australian-born um, novelist, uh, something of an odd case, and we will discuss this in a second. Basically, I would say a comedy, a marriage comedy of the sort that we will find again in Hitchcock's filmography, for example, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. But this film uh, comes immediately after the adaptation of screen of uh, stage play by John Goldsworthy, which we discussed last time. That was The Skin Game. And uh, this film is strikingly different in tone. I will just briefly uh, summarize the plot so that we have it out of the way and then we can discuss it. Basically, the plot is quite simple. A marriage, uh, a working class marriage or uh, of a clerk and a... Uh, housewife, I guess, um, at some point they are uh, extremely bored with their tedious and predictable lives uh, and uh, the husband expresses a wish for their life to change dramatically, for finally to experience life. And uh, they inherit money, a sudden inheritance that comes out of nowhere, that is basically like this deus ex machina, uh, enables them to undertake a long and exciting journey, first to France, then to the East Seas and to exotic countries uh, and experience possible affairs. Uh, husband and wife both have sort of an affair, extramarital affair, and then come back to one another aboard a uh, ship that uh, <laughs> crashes. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss it later on. But basically, they they remarry in a way through this crisis. They they end up remarried. So we have this uh, common plot of uh, remarriage that's basically rooted in Shakespeare and uh, and uh, stuff. So uh, yeah, we have a story of a marriage, basically a marriage comedy uh, with some exotic elements, right? Yes, that's correct. And the very title of the film is rooted in Shakespeare, actually, right? It's a uh... It's a quote from um, Tempest, from the Tempest, uh, Hitchcock's uh, exotic play. Uh, so it suits the movie very well. Yes, this is, it's a very interesting film. I must say that I saw it twice within the last few days. Uh, there are two reasons for that. First is that I had a very nice DVD copy, uh, but without English subtitles. And as you mentioned uh, previously, uh, these early sound films by Hitchcock and, you know, early sound movies in uh, generally and especially British, I would say, uh, are quite hard for us as foreigners to comprehend fully, right? Uh, you get 70-80% of the dialogue at best. So, but I, but it was visually very good. And then I also decided to rewatch it with um, English subtitles on Amazon Prime. Uh, but also I wanted to see it once again because I was, you know, maybe not amazed, but I was really um, fascinated by some of the um, some of Hitchcock's choices, by some of the, the jokes, the structure of the whole thing. Uh, as you mentioned, it's an odd beast. It's a strange movie, but it's really enjoyable even nowadays. And I would say it's one of the most uh, contemporary Hitchcock British movies um, in this way that the, the very premise of the movie, the the very beginning, so a couple that is bored with their ordinary lives 
the beginning is, as many scholars suggest, uh, inspired or uh, imitating uh, King Vidor's The Crowd, right? So his famous silent movie, which begins with this um, uh, amazing uh, overhead traveling shot. We see rows of desks of, you know, uh, working, working men, people working in offices. So here we have a similar shot, also uh, quite ingeniously designed by Hitchcock, because it's just one shot which shows us the, the hero who's uh, leaving his office, going home, and we see, you know, the whole... The, the, the several rooms and we see other people working there and it's all done in one shot and we get this feeling that you know it's a crowd of people who just you know have this lead this, these bureaucratic lives so the very beginning is that you know they want to experience something different they want to break the routine and you know maybe uh, look for some adventure uh, and it's I, I find it contemporary. I was reminded of um, Albert Brooks' Lost in America, for example, which I know is it's one of your fav one of your uh, favorite movies. Uh, it's a great movie indeed, American movie from the 1980s. And this film is is a bit similar. Um, I wouldn't I want I wouldn't say that it's a you know it's a perfect early Hitchcock movie. I think it's it has many flaws, but they make the whole thing even more interesting you know for example the uneven cast uh, you know there are some actors that you feel are in a good place and that uh, they 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 deliver good performances like joan barry for example the, the main her heroine i find her performance pretty good but of course the the main protagonist fred hill uh, played by henry kendall i wouldn't say it's a good performance and also the way hitchcock uh, characterizes him is pretty unfavorable. He's he's not a he's not a nice guy. He's not someone that we would you know identify with. So we get this portrait of a maybe failed or a threatened masculinity. It, it becomes more and more visible in the latter parts of the movie. So yeah, so there are many interesting interesting things to to look at. I would say when it comes to Regent Strange. Absolutely. Uh, yes, the title is Shakespearean. I would agree with what you are saying. Well, the, the lack of chemistry between Henry Kendall and John Barry is quite apparent. By the way, we have already heard John Barry uh, in Hitchcock's films. She was the uh, actress who provided the English voice in the sound version of Blackmail. Uh, so uh, here we can both hear and see her. And she is quite funny. Is this sort of almost like this crazy screwball comedy heroine. Uh, and it's not a surprise that in Hitchcock's later take on this, let's say, genre of screwball, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, the female part will be played by Carol Lombard, who was one of the beloved crazy ladies of uh, uh, screwball comedy. So here, this this one is also a bit uh, um, ditzy, as they used to say. So um, it's it's she's definitely more vivacious than the guy. Um, Hitchcock himself... Uh, rather cruelly uh, blamed the lack of chemistry between them on uh, Henry Kendall's supposed homosexuality. Uh, uh, I didn't check, double check that information, but this is what Hitchcock said in an interview. Um, the interesting thing about this literary source, which apparently is nearly impossible to get nowadays unless you have access to extremely good libraries it's out of print and basically out of sight this dale collins source it's funny because um for years before charles barr's book english hitchcock uh, people assumed that you know this book either didn't exist <laughs> Uh, which actually uh, is, is uh, uh, you know, there's this funny video introduction to the DVD of uh, Rich and Strange with French scholar yes. Noel Simsolo, who says that, oh, Dale Collins probably didn't exist, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yes, that was very so, funny. Uh, well, he did exist, and uh, moreover, he was a successful uh, writer. Uh, his most famous work was Ordeal, which has a similar plot. Um and uh, the book, apparently, of course, I haven't read it, but uh, Richard, uh, but Charles Barr did. And uh, uh, the book apparently is identical to the film. There was a possible idea that maybe Hitchcock actually had a hand in creating this book, that it was a fruit of their conversations, Collins and Hitchcock. So maybe those two things were basically born simultaneously. So far, we don't know what was the case, but apparently the book and the film are very, very close so that's one thing 
uh, one thing to remember. Yes, and I, I think McGilligan kind of expands this theory and suggests that uh, the production of the movie was a bit postponed, and in the meantime, Dale Collins uh, wrote this book um, based on the conversations with both Alma Alma Reville and Alfred Hitchcock. And so that's in this way, as you mentioned, it's kind of appeared sim simultaneously. But McGilligan suggests that the idea for the movie was first. So I think uh, so this Hitchcock biographer suggests that it's not a, you know, it's not a straight adaptation. So it's a bit confusing and uh, it, it adds up to the um, maybe not a mystery, but some um, exotic, you know, dimension uh, of the movie. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and uh, I, I I love your um, comparison to Lost in America. It's a longer tradition of you know this rejuvenation of a marriage through uh, uh, you know complete change. And um, uh, I would say that for for me, what was striking was this another appearance of exotic themes that we saw in Hitchcock's The Pleasure Garden, which uh, was made. A couple of years before, and we covered it in uh, our first episode. The whole idea of the East and of the exotic world, and of the confrontation of a Western couple with the you know uh, the mysterious and Orientalized um, uh, East, here is also present. So that was quite interesting, and uh, for me, probably the most interesting thing about both. Lost in America and Richard Strange is that it is the male character who initiates the journey. Uh, at the beginning, uh, both the w both women who are, uh, I mean, both in Lost Amer uh, in America and Rich and Strange, are uh, quite comfortably ensconced in the domestic uh, uh, sphere. Uh, it's very important. It's a childless domestic uh, sphere. So we see uh, Joanne Barry actually sewing on a sewing machine on her table, and she doesn't seem restless. It's not like she's complaining about this situation. It's the man who is complaining. His uh, sense of adventure is not being nourished and it's uh, funny that both in the book and in the film he points to a print to a photo uh, a picture of um uh, of a uh, of a ship um in the middle of the sea as the sort of signifier of male adventure you know that i'm here stuck behind the desk i'm the slave of the office and you know the real adventure would be you know, to sail down uh, the sea and to be a sailman. Uh, so, um, a sailor. That's, that's interesting because uh, uh, when you remember Rare Window and this um, um, tension between L.B. Jeffries and his fiance, uh, it's exactly the same situation. The, the guy wants to travel, he wants to take photos in exotic locations, he wants to uh, experience the adrenaline rush of putting himself in harm's way, uh, whereas the woman tends to be domestic and she wants to, you know, uh, even if there is no talk of children, then, you know, she wants to create this, this small nest for them in Greenwich Village. And also L.B. Jeffries had on his wall pictures of his own adventures, of, of the, the pictures he took. So they were there to remind that, you know, somewhere there, there is this more exciting life, which I will completely lost if I, you know, decide to start this domesticized uh, uh, relationship with Grace Kelly. So I, I find that interesting and uh, probably also something of Hitchcock's own dreams, you know, to uh, lead this exciting life, uh, life of adventure. For him, this adventure came true with the conquest of, of Hollywood, I would say. These are great points. I totally agree with you. Uh, the comparison with Rear Window is awesome. Uh, so just let me add two things. Um, also, I think we didn't mention the, I think the American title of the of this movie, which doesn't make sense, right? East of Shanghai, East of Shanghai. But we know that uh, the protagonists do not go that far. They never even, uh, cr you know, reach Shanghai, and they certainly do not reach anywhere near to East of Shanghai. So that's funny when you kind of add it to this Dale Collins as the author confusion. So it makes this this movie as this kind of nonsense exercise in a way. And that's totally true. I found a fascinating um, observation in Ken Mogg's 
um, essay on Hitchcock's literary sources. It's an essay from uh, uh, the Hitchcock Companion, um, published uh, not published quite recently, and he writes there that Hitchcock's favorite uh, literary heroine was Madame Bovary. And when we add to, to what you said, when we added to this idea that the, the, the life is so boring that we must do something, of course, in, uh, in case of Flaubert's heroine, she's a woman, and that's more, um, that's more complementary to the general cultural narratives, right? Because in Rear Window, we have 1950s, so the era of you know, suburban domesticity. Of course, we are in New York, but basically in that era, um women were were the, the 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 members of society that could suffer because of this domesticity and uh, often suffered also psychologically right we have nowadays we have um, pretty straightforward movies about that like revolutionary road by Sam Mendes you know this idea that women um were relegated to the home sphere and you know they just they didn't have any adventure at all besides you know washing dishes and stuff like that so it's, it's it sounds terrible right but in hitchcock we have the the reverse the the men are bored with life and this comparison with bovary i think is really interesting because uh, it suggests that many hitchcock's protagonists and actually ken mock um uh, mentions rich and strange in that context um, are kind of provoking their adventures, right? Like uh, L.B. Jeffries in Rear Window, um, in a way also Roger O. Thornhill in North by Northwest. They have this steady life, these maybe... I mean, L.B. Jeffries doesn't, but now he has in the... When we see him in the movie, he he just, you know, he's thirsty for any kind of adventure. So there is this persistent theme in Hitchcock that we need to break with our routine and maybe look for something interesting. So if we trace it back to Madame Bovary, it's really interesting. It makes uh, Hitchcock's uh, cinema, maybe it gives him this literary pedigree that maybe we wouldn't um, uh, suppose at the beginning. It's a, I think it's a bit surprising. That's a great trope. I, I, I never read this essay that you mentioned, but it seems very interesting and uh, uh, well, the main difference, of course, between uh, Roger Tarnhill, L.B. Jeffries, and um, Fred from *Rich and Strange* is that the first two are bachelors, and uh, the, the the you know the they they don't suffer from the tedium of of domesticity. They they are sing either single or they don't commit to living with their partner, uh, like Jeffries. Um, so they they uh, rem they um, preserve this romance of bachelorhood, which uh, uh, is is especially uh, in a place like Greenwich Village, uh, in in uh, uh, Rare Window is extremely exciting uh, so uh, they uh, and this is why LB Jeffries doesn't want to relinquish his freedom because you know the, the marriage equals death basically <laughs> and uh, here we are in a married couple and as we know Hitchcock was married at that time to Alma Reville already and he had a four-year-old daughter pa Patricia uh, so um, Noel Simsolo actually makes a big point about the couple's child childlessness. That, that this is this is the like basic dramatic um, uh, problem in the film. Do you do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? I I also saw this video and I was I was thinking about it when I was watching the movie for the second time. Well. I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, Hitchcock by then was bound by both marriage and fatherhood, and uh, he, he, he never experienced that freedom that he, you know, uh, grants his characters in this film. So uh, on some level, I think he was always about breaking away from those ties, you know, about having this fantasy of... Um, of, of an intense romantic and sexual relationship that will morph into vertigo and, you know, uh, um, even frenzy in a way. Uh, yeah, in vertigo, a, in, another another certified bachelor, right? A, a, another, yes, absolutely. Uh, again, James Stewart. So here it's, it's the marriage. It's... Um, but I, I again, I find it interesting that the guy is the one who points to the picture, right? He says, you know, this is the life, uh, how life should uh, look like. And um, uh, but you know, for me, the the, the strangest, <laughs> richest, and strangest uh, part of the film comes definitely on the ship when they wake up and suddenly the ship is deserted. It's you know, there has been some kind of a crash. 
the ship is deserted you know they it's like um like a surrealist scene and many um, scholars connect this film to surrealism because it's like a nightmare you know first they have they are seasick like we know alma and hitchcock were on their honeymoon you know so there's this queasiness then you know the this whole let's say extramarital affairs and then they wake up and the ship is empty it's like a david lynch film you know they could they yeah, could literally totally. uh, and then the 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 incredible scenes with the the mysterious chinaman uh, one of them dies in front of our eyes and then uh, there's this incredible scene when we always analyze hitchcock's relationship to food this is the only i think film in he in which he allowed people to eat with their hands they are eating with their hands the rice with meat so they are like babies they are like infants you know dabbling with food in a in a almost Fro freudian way and uh, and then they discover that probably what they ate is a cat uh, because they see the skin of a cat so you know it's it's like this primary nightmare you know what did i just eat you know what what, what it was that i scooped with my hand and why it's so so it's it's a crazy film and this is why i like it because uh, hitchcock does things here that i think he will never do again in his <laughs> films just to make film totally nonsensical in such a free way Exactly, I totally agree. I think it's a nonsensical film, and let's let's just say that they have a black cat at home, um, you know, so that they have one, they have a real cat in in in, Br in London, and then they encounter this stray black cat on, on a ship, and yes, as you mentioned, they then they see it um, kind of, they they just see the the skin of this cat uh, put to the wall. I think that, yes, it's a nightmare, but let's also say that they um, go through this kind of purification. They are purified after this whole experience. So in the first part of the movie, their marriage is at stake and their marriage is threatened, but then their life is threatened. So we have this kind of like in these jokes that if you feel your apartment is too small, just get a get a goat into the apartment for a week. And then after the goat will be gone, you will realize, wow, it's so much space here. Uh, so it's, it's, it's similar here. So they, they think they have some problems, right? They... Actually, it's of course, it's not explored uh, convincingly, I would say. Their relationship, their marital uh, relationship is not really uh, convincing. It's not the the level of sophistication and detail that we'll have in uh, screwball comedies, right? Uh, I would say. But but yeah, they, they have this um, um, extra marital affairs. And both of these affairs are not really... I mean, we, we know as viewers, I think, from the very beginning that nothing will come out of it, right? I mean, the, the main protagonist, the, the man, Henry, right? Henry is his name. Uh, he needs like almost an hour to realize that this princess is a false princess. We know it from the very beginning, from the very first moment. And also we, we may assume that this bachelor, this older man that is more and more interested in the, the, the character of John Barry will also go his own way after all, right? So we know these are not promising uh, adventures for them. And then they realize that, you know, it's really... So th the whole movie is, in fact, this reaffirmation of British domesticity, right? It's very, very palpable towards the end that they are very happy to come back to their uh, steak and kidney pudding, right? So the at the beginning, the Henry is fed up with that, with this dish, because he eats it, like, almost every day. And it's a, when, when, when we talk about food, it's another important element in this movie. Then when he's seasick, he, there is this uh, incredible, almost like silent era movie shot with, with the menu. And these um, names of dishes are popping up because he's seasick and he, he just he cannot eat anything. And he's just, you know, fed up with all of that. I think it's also interesting when we think about Hitchcock's um, um, taste and his taste in food. And then they, you know, suddenly uh, after this horrible adventure, everything is um, seems nice to them. So that's that's one thing. So they, they are in a way they are purified. But I would say the very the, the very end of the movie is very ambiguous. It's like it's ambiguous in a way that, you know, some scruple comedies are. 
So on the one hand, they are remarried symbolically, right? They come back to their house, but before they um, witness the birth of a child on this China, Chinese junk ship, right? And um, their reactions are quite different. The, um, the woman, she's amazed and she wants to help uh, in the process and she's fascinated by, uh, by that. And, you know, the Henry is, is more withdrawn. He, he, I think he considers children as kind of nasty or, you know, not important at all. He even mentions that we have ourselves, you know, we, so saying you know, something like we don't need this child. But then he also, there is this three seconds when he realizes that this father is very proud, you know, to have this child. And so maybe he will also be proud. But the, the ending doesn't really tell us if they decided to, to, to have a child. Because there is a quarrel about the apartment, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes, the um, you know later on in, in Hitchcock's films, the issues of paternity will be much uh, more important, and the issues of family, like in Shadow of a Doubt, for example. Uh, so we will see see that later on. But uh, yeah, here um, I would uh, say that uh, for, first of all, we forgot to mention that this movie is also both sound and silent because it does use uh, sub, uh, uh, intertitles in a way that uh, are um, redolent of silent cinema and uh, i would agree with what you are saying also you know it it has this incredible similarity to some stories that hitchcock himself said about going to berlin and being shocked by sexual behavior there so here the british couple is shocked by the sexual behavior in paris apparently hitchcock and alma also went to folie berger and the hitchcock describes a lesbian scene that he witnessed again so he's uh, he already described the lesbian scenes that he saw in berlin so this is something clearly that he was fascinated with. And um, here they are scared, but also in relations to class, because they are definitely anxious about, you know, revealing that they are not familiar with the upper class behavior. When they walk through the uh, foyer, the hall uh, of the hotel, they, you know, walk very quietly and timidly because they feel they don't belong there, even though they have this money they won in the lottery they don't belong in this upper echelon world so this is definitely something that hitchcock was undergoing himself as a son of a, of a you know a shopkeeper who later on in his life will uh, you know uh, um, associate with the most refined and aristocratic uh, strata of um, uh, Anglo-Saxon society. So this is something that he uh, definitely felt himself. So yeah, in, in general, I would say that this is an adventurous film. It's uh, it's funny. It's uh, weird. Uh, it's surprisingly deep. Not the masterpiece that some people claim it to be, like Chabrol and Romer, who said basically that it's perfect and it was so underrated because you know it's such a clear vision i don't think it's a clear vision i think that hitchcock didn't know what he was doing uh much um, and uh you know at, at the end of the novel the characters meet their own creator at the end of the film supposedly hitchcock also wanted to include the scene in which he meets his characters and talks to them and says that oh this story that you just told me wouldn't make a good movie at all apparently we don't know if it was shot or it was just edited out of the film this uh, scene so there is no hitchcock cameo here in this film but overall I, I would say that yes it's one of the freest strangest exercises in hitchcock's uh, filmography so i would ra rate it quite highly in my uh, canon yes uh, i agree and you mentioned the the uh, Chabrol and Romer book and you know you can uh, there is now I want to tell something to our listeners you can go to our uh, fan page and there is a quote from from that book uh, posted if you're interested and yes they consider it a great movie and I was just thinking that when you look uh, once again uh, towards Hollywood then you realize that at the same time when it comes to exotic adventures you have of course, Joseph von, von Sternberg's movies like Morocco and uh, the Shanghai Express, by the way. So then you realize that there is, you know, a huge gap between uh, British film industry and uh, Hollywood, of course. So it's hard to look at this film 
uh, with similar expectations that we 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 look at uh, Sternberg's movies, which were technically perfect, which were aesthetically perfect, and also nonsense in a beautiful beautiful way. So that's certainly not the same level. And I agree that this movie is just so strange and. It, it sometimes it feels that um, the plot was developing as they were shooting that you know there is this feeling that it starts in london then they go to paris and then suddenly they go to these strange places then suddenly this um, these affairs are important then the, there is this shipwreck and i think shi- shipwreck and uh, ships in general this is something that hitchcock was interested in and maybe couldn't explore as much as he wanted right one of his unreleased project uh, was I think connected with with um, shipwreck, um, with showing that. So that's all all pretty interesting. And also this, um, I just want to add that I was also reminded of the second version of the man who knew too much and the Morocco scenes. You know this theme of Europeans in this so-called exotic locations. We po- probably in 2020 we should choose a better word to describe. Uh, these uh, non-European places but there is this feeling that it's also space for these uh, white people you know to kind of explore themselves and of course there are some um, jokes that we would consider offensive nowadays there is this uh, joke with this Chinese servant who enters the room in a hotel all the time and they just shout at him and it's like this comic relief and it doesn't really uh, look good nowadays, um, but of course that's part that's part of this era and that's part of the pleasure of looking at these old movies. So yes, so a strange beast as you mentioned, but but really, uh, I think we we should recommend to all our re- listeners because it's one of the more interesting uh, early sound Hitchcock movies. Absolutely, fully agreed. I also thought of the second version of the Man Who Knew Too Much. And uh, only by then the couple is American, not European. That's the difference because Hitchcock also became an American. So that's the real transformation. And of course, they have a child. So that's that's the major difference that the whole plot actually will revolve around the child being kidnapped and uh, restoring the family unit. But absolutely, that post-colonial jokes that they are there um, are actually colonial are, are quite... Um, unsavory to see today and Hitchcock was definitely uh, guilty of that uh, a, a slightly jingoistic approach so uh, uh, yeah I, I'm glad that we both liked it I definitely we recommend it to our listeners uh, and um, thank you so much for joining the um, uh, podcast again and uh, please visit our um, um, fan page on Facebook Foreign Correspondence Deeper into Hitchcock and uh, please follow us on Spotify iTunes P- please do review us on iTunes if you are following us there and uh, do spread the word this is a non-profit podcast that we are purely uh, um, that's developed purely for pleasure f- and hopefully for a pleasure of all of our listeners so thank you so much for listening and uh, uh, see you soon at uh, foreign correspondence deeper into hitchcock